tell someone I do, as I did with you. Kelly McGillis and Kurt Russell fall in love despite a dangerous family feud in Winter People. That's one of five new movies we'll be reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert. I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. Our first movie is indeed Winter People, a dreary story about boring people who live in a wretched neck of the woods and are ruled by ignorance and prejudice. And then, just to make things worse, a saintly hero comes along and tries to inspire them to improve themselves. The movie stars Kurt Russell as a general clockmaker whose wife dies, leaving him with a young daughter. He sets out on a journey, and after his truck stalls in a river, he's befriended by a local woman played by Kelly McGillis. They go back to the truck, only to find it cruelly pillaged by the evil Campbell clan. The black sheep of the family is Cole Campbell, who fathered McGillis' baby, but then turned into a mean and foul-tempered drunkard. Nicholas confesses her secret, but Russell says he loves her anyway. There's nobody else around he could love. First thing I knew, he was on top of me. Kissing me. Devouring me like a starved man. I wish he'd been more careful. You don't mind? Only that he hurt you. And this movie provides additional evidence supporting my theory of the Cole Rule, which is that no movie made since 1977 containing the character named Cole is any good. What I can't figure out is why anybody wanted to make this movie in the first place. If there is anything more depressing than a screen full of vile-tempered, unshaven, louse-ridden, violent hillbillies, it's a noble clockmaker who turns up to reform them. The clockmaker is supposed to be sort of a cross between Gandhi and Thoreau, I think, and he always turns the other cheek but there is little conviction in his philosophy, and when he eventually prevails, it's not because of his beliefs, but because he's Scandinavian. It doesn't feel the cold when he pulls Cole Campbell into the freezing river. Almost as chilly are the love scenes between Russell and McGillis, which feel devout rather than passionate. Winter People is dreary, uninspired, cold, and grim. Yeah, I was stunningly <laughs> bored by the film, as you apparently were. Uh... Kelly McGillis, period dramas are very difficult to do, yes, they are. and she just doesn't seem to fit there. I mean, we see her, and we see right through the castle, but it doesn't seem uh, to mean anything. These people are a bunch of unimportant people. There was a film called Shy People a while back, where we went into a bayou country and backwoods, and we saw backwoods characters that now, by comparison, seem very real. I didn't appreciate the film that much, but I certainly appreciated it more having seen this, which is almost a parody. It's like a, one of these classic illustrated comic books of Ivanhoe or something. It's just goofy. This yeah, well, the Campbell ca clan just rides on, you know, yeah. shoots up everything, swears at everybody, spits tobacco yeah. juice, and rides off again. Uh, I'm telling you, the, there was a movie, do you remember a movie almost 20 years ago called Will Tinney? Yes. It starred Charles Heston. Heston. It was once again about a man and a woman who are snowbound in a cabin during a long winter, and there's a little child involved, and they fall in love. It's a good film. It's the same kind of basic situation, but this movie just has absolutely no inspiration, no new ideas, Nothing. and it's just a real grind. Well, all right, our next film is called Say Anything, and it is something quite special, a rare film about young people in love that is not exploitive, not superficial, not lecherous, not, well, not like anything I've seen in quite a while from American movies. Say Anything begins with the brightest, prettiest girl in school telling her classmates that she is desperately afraid of the future, and that's a refreshing jolt of candor right away at the beginning of the film. Then an awkward young man asks her for a date. You busy on Friday? Yeah, I have to help my father. Are you busy on Saturday? Saturday I have some things to do around the house. So you're, so you're monumentally busy? Well, not monumentally. That's Ione Skye as the girl John Cusack plays the nervous boy. He's even more nervous when he meets her father on their first date. Look, I know you're busy. You don't have to entertain me, but uh, you can trust me. Uh, I'll tell you a couple things about myself. I'm 19. I've been overseas for a couple semesters. Now I'm back. I'm an athlete, so I rarely drink. I heard kickboxing. I heard of kickboxing, sport of the future. Don the Dragon Wilson, Benny the Jedder, Edith Murray Smith. I'm the champion of the sport. I can see by your face, no. My point is you can relax because your daughter will be safe with me for the next seven to eight hours, sir. 
Say Anything gives us a rare frank father-daughter relationship as Ione Skye tells John Mahoney, playing her father, about her feelings for Cusack. So we started spending all this time together as friends. But I could feel him getting anxious. And then I knew that there would be a confrontation over getting physical. <clears throat> he started to get that look at the end of the night. Do you know that look? And then, you know, it's going to be an issue. So I went through all the different feelings and all the different arguments you're supposed to go through. Did he ever get rough with you? Dad, no. But I didn't want any problems, so I decided not to sleep with him. But then I attacked him anyway. That's very fresh writing. Say Anything was written and directed by Cameron Crowe, who also wrote Fast Times at Ridgemont High, and he certainly knows the speech patterns and moods of young people. Their nervousness, their idealism, their bravado, their fragility. Cameron Crowe's script also reflects the randomness of life, with surprising things happening to the girl's father. It's a rich, textured film that reminded me of The Accidental Tourist, but just done at the adolescent level, with its heartbroken and heartwarming characters struggling just to stay afloat. I admire Say Anything very, very much. I admire it, too, and not only for Ione Sky and uh, John Cusack, but also for John Mahoney as the mm -hmm. father, because yes. this is very much a real movie about parents and yes. the problems that they can have and the troubles they can get into. Yes. The parents who are not seen as some kind of distant, stupid uh, people who just kind of want to mess up their kids' lives, but as people who are very complicated in their own right. And the relationship between these two young people is based upon the kinds of things that I remember happening when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. Not the dumb stuff that takes place in most teenage movies, but the real heart-tugging stuff that involves real relationships. I thought of other films that uh, this film, in terms of quality, uh, take the kids in breaking away and mm -hmm. make them a little older, and, and the family there, mm -hmm. and put them under a little bit of strain, mm -hmm. and you have the same kind of story. Take the family of terms of endearment, if you will, and bring them down younger in age, and you have the same kind of thing. And all of these pictures that we're talking about have in common is the kind of writing that seems very natural and yet surprising because we're inundated with so many cookie-cutter kinds mm -hmm. of pictures that don't have, represent humanity in any kind of way. It, it's so fresh to say anything is a movie. Basically, it's a movie about values. It's about how you want to live your life and what your standards are, and that's, that's pretty rare. Coming up next, Field of Dreams about an Iowa farmer who hears a voice which advises him to build a baseball diamond right there in the cornfield. It's a magical movie, one of the best I've seen this year. It stars Kevin Costner and Amy Madigan as an Iowa farm couple who are just about making ends meet. And then one day, Costner hears a voice out in the field, and it advises him to build a baseball diamond on his farm. Then he sees a vision of the diamond, and the voice hints that if he builds it, Shoeless Joe Jackson of the 1919 Black Sox just might come back from the grave to redeem himself and his reputation by playing on it. Costner builds the diamond against everybody's opposition, except that he does have the support of his wife, but it looks like his decision may bankrupt his farm. Hey, do you realize how much this land is worth? Yeah. Yeah. 2200 bucks an acre. Oh, you got to realize we can't keep a useless baseball diamond in the middle of rich farmland. Another voice tells Costner to take a journey out east and find a great American writer now in seclusion. The writer, played by James Earl Jones, once dreamed of playing baseball. Start! Well, what? Start! New York Giants, 1922. He played one game. He never got the bat. He saw it! What did I see, Ray? Here's in Minnesota! Man, we were the only ones who saw it. Did you hear the voice, too? It's all right to admit it. It's what told me to find you. Did you, did you hear it? Later, the two of them travel up to Minnesota, where Costner finds a legendary and saintly doctor, played by Burt Lancaster, who sacrificed his dream of playing in the majors to go into medicine. Chance to squint to the sky so blue that it hurts your eyes just to look at it. To feel the tingle in your arm as you connect with the ball. To run the bases, stretch a double into a triple, and flop face first into third. Wrap your arms around the bag. That's my wish, Rick and Silver. Well, what do you know? Shoeless Joe Jackson does turn up to play once again on that diamond out there in the field. He's played by Ray Liotta. Ray, I hope you don't mind, but we got tired of just having practices, so we brought another team out with us so we could have some real games. I don't mind. Where'd they come from? Where did we come from? 
<laughs> you wouldn't believe how many guys wanted to play here. I had to beat him off with a stick. This is a very hard movie to describe, and that's part of what makes it so good. It's the kind of fantasy that James Stewart or Henry Fonda might have felt at home in. A movie about daring to dream and putting your money where your mouth is. It's also a wonderful baseball movie. The sight of the ghosts of those great old baseball players materializing out of the cornfields to hit a few and feel a few to play one more time captures in a very special way what is timeless about the game of baseball. Field of Dreams is so fragile and so perfect, it's like a miracle, a completely original and visionary movie about the love of baseball. Well, I know that that's what it's trying to be, and I certainly wanted it to be that, but it didn't work on me. Uh, the fantasy fell apart. Bull Durham, to me, of recent pictures, is to me even more pure uh, about love of baseball. I mean, it, for me. Uh, this is a picture that really tries uh, to pull off a very difficult thing, building that baseball field in the cornfield. And I like the visual look of it. I'll never forget seeing the field in, in the field. In the field. Uh, but when it starts to collect the other characters and bring it in, the picture, I think, is just too ambitious for its own good. And oh. I didn't, it's not bad. It's not a bad film. It's just, I just oh, didn't buy the see. see, I really thought it was a very particularly good film. Now, Bull Durham is a realistic film, more or less. I mean, it's oh, oh, more or less in the real it's world. very colorful. This movie is about the soul of baseball. This is about the intangible, mystical, unspeakable things that people feel when they go to a baseball park. Yeah and about the American history that's evolved in it. There's one speech in this movie about the history of baseball that literally made a tingle go up my spine because it's so heartfelt. If you love baseball, I think it's a real, real uh, I'm, special movie. I'm a, I'm a baseball nut enough to know that they, uh, when they say there's a very good line, they're saying about Ty Cobb not being invited because uh, none of the other players wanted to bring him back when they bring back all <laughs> he was that He was my hero, and he's one of, I was glad that he wasn't a part of that thing. Uh, <laughs> I just think that this conceit here is very, either you either buy it or you don't. It's one of those things, and I didn't buy it. I, it, I think they're just trying too hard. Coming up next, the father's teenage daughter blossoms, and a daddy is distraught. Tony Danza stars, and she's out of control. I'm afraid you'll have to leave. You don't understand. I'm a parent. Control. And like the movie Say Anything, which we reviewed earlier, She's Out of Control is about a beautiful teenage girl and her father and the boy she dates. But the similarity ends immediately because She's Out of Control quickly turns into a trashy TV-style movie that tries vainly to satirize its subjects. While the girl's father is out of town, she undergoes a beauty makeover that stuns her dad, Tony Danza, upon his return. That's right, Tony Danza plays a father here, and he plays one quite badly. Dad? <laughs> well, isn't it great? Janet, help me. Isn't she beautiful? Doug? Doug? Dad Danza tries to spend some time with his now popular daughter, and he discovers he has to make an appointment to see her. How Thursday? Dad, I'm thinking I'm sorry. Friday. Dad, I can't. Saturday. Dad, I'm sorry. Sunday. Sunday, please. Give me Sunday. I want Sunday. What am I doing Sunday? Okay, okay, cancel it. Danza's voice is really grating, and in a typically exploitive scene, he becomes disturbed when he sees his voluptuous daughter at the beach. She's out of control is really a depressing experience. It is neither lifelike nor an effective fantasy. That scene you just saw tries to rip off 10, but it isn't 10. Rather, this film exists in a strange netherworld, I think, of what Hollywood considers entertainment, but is really a sinkhole of tawdry values. The film is photographed ineptly in tight TV shots, and when I saw She's Out of Control, I became so depressed, I actually thought about quitting my job as a film critic, feeling as though the movies had abandoned me, because what I was seeing there really wasn't a movie. It was some sort of strange concoction of uh, really just someone who didn't understand what movies are all about. Fortunately, however, I would see the movie say anything later in the same day, and all is right with the world. I'm still on the job. You know, people probably think you're joking when you said no, that I'm you were really thinking that. of quitting your job. But I know what you felt, because I sat there and I thought, life is precious, life is short, and the idiots who made this film are taking two hours of my life and robbing it from me in order to give me less than nothing. Yeah. I mean, a movie like this is a crime, because what it does is it robs life from people by requiring them to spend two hours having such a terrible experience happen to them. Now, yeah. Jean-Luc Godard, the great French director, right. once said, 
the way to criticize a movie is to make another movie, and you put your finger right on it, mm -hmm. because the next movie we saw the same day was Say Anything, mm -hmm. also about a father, also about his daughter. Right. Same kind of basic situation, but here's a trash movie, and here's a great movie. Uh, it's really bad. I always wonder when I'm in a bad, I don't know if you have this reaction, when I'm in a bad movie in a theater, mm -hmm. uh, aren't you surprised that people stay? I think maybe they're just, they've spent their money, but they don't have any place to go for two hours. Yes, but I would say this, when you talk about robbing your life, see, my thing I've always wanted to say to people, I've always wanted to stand up in the middle of a bad movie in a uh -huh. theater and say, aren't your lives worth more for two hours than a, even, say, seven bucks in New York City? Go stand Three fifty an hour. Every, that's below the minimum wage, the minimum wage. <laughs> I mean, get out and live. Go up. stand in the lobby and talk. Yeah. You know? Oscar Brotman, a Chicago film exhibitor, once told me many years ago, he said there's a rule, he said, if nothing has happened by the end of the first reel, nothing is going to happen. Yeah. You know? And when I saw uh, this movie, I oh, knew it was that I, after the first minute, I knew that nothing yeah, was going to happen. Basic errors. Okay, yeah. coming up next, two sailing ships, a man, a wife, and a killer in dead calm. Oh, what are you doing? Good to get that off our chest, wasn't it? You know? I you... still, you know, normally I say that that's the great thing about our job, is that we can get back at a film the way that the public can, but I can't get back at that movie. Yeah. Uh, no, I didn't do it justice. It I really, did, I, I was did, really unhappy. It did a wrong to us that will never be righted. And so all we can do is go ahead and review our next movie, which is named Dead Calm, and it takes place on the open sea, far from land, far from any other ships. On board a sailing yacht, a husband and wife are taking a long cruise when they spot a sailing schooner in distress. The schooner contains only one passenger, and after they take him on board, the husband goes over to look at the sinking ship, and then the rescue castaway turns sinister, and his story doesn't hold water. There wasn't any food poisoning, was there? You want to do this now? All right. He tried to kill me, Ray. They tried to stop the light out of me if you could possibly grasp that concept. That Billy Zane is the crazed killer and Nicole Kidman is the wife. Her husband, played by Sam Neill, realizes the deception, but he is unable to get back on board his own yacht. The killer wants to ruin the husband on the sinking ship and it's up to the wife to outsmart or outfight him. <laughs> Dead Calm is a very simple story that basically involves only three people. It's kind of a variation on all those great old thrillers about dangerous hitchhikers. But it has a lot of new twists, especially after the husband is trapped underwater in a locked hold on the sinking ship and has to attempt an escape that would have stopped even Houdini. The performances are strong, the action is straightforward, the suspense is real, and the movie is a good, sound action adventure. I'm really glad that you like this because I wasn't sure whether anyone else would like the picture. There is some uh, familiar stuff, cliché stuff at the end with uh, the killer that I won't go into, and we've seen that all before. But the bulk of this movie is really quite effectively directed, shot, and cast. Exceptionally well cast with realistic type people who suddenly have this awful thing uh, happen to them. And I like the, the minimal approach of this picture, which is, just, as you said, three people, two boats, and uh, they made an interesting movie out of Philip Noyce directed it. And the Philip Noyce, yeah. yeah. The great open sea, so mm -hmm. that you can see that help is going to come from anywhere. This reminded me of some of those novels by John D. MacDonald about ordinary people who go out to sea and suddenly find themselves mm -hmm. trapped in a situation that really tests them in terms of who they are and what they're capable of. And that's what mm -hmm. happens to the people in this You movie. see how fragile they are because of um, the, this big expanse of water, obviously, surrounding them. Also, I like the way visually the director... Uh, shoots the woods, the beautiful woods of the boat, mm -hmm. are also be very fragile. They're always being splintered. Yeah. And so you get that sense of, the, of the, the fabric of the boats and the fabric of the people. Very well done. Now let's take another look at the movies we reviewed this week. Two thumbs down for Winter People, the boring, not the least bit credible story of Mean Mountain Families and a gentle clockmaker. Two thumbs up, way up, for Say Anything, a remarkably sensitive and funny slice of life about a father, his daughter, and her boyfriend. A split vote on Field of Dreams, the baseball fantasy. Roger bought the fantasy and considers it a great baseball movie. I disagree. I thought the film tried to cover too many bases. Two thumbs down, way down, for She's Out of Control, the teen comedy that we both agree 
is one of the worst experiences of our professional lives. Two thumbs up for Dead Calm, a fine little thriller about terror on the high seas. So not a bad week, even though we were thinking about resigning. Uh, Dead <laughs> Calm was uh, exceptional. Dead say Calm, anything. say anything. And I really want to put in a strong plug for Field of Dreams. I'm surprised you didn't like it. I think it's really one of the best movies I've seen this year. Okay? We'll be back next week with five new movies, including See You in the Morning, starring Jeff Bridges and Farrah Fawcett, and Disorganized Crime, starring Corbin Burnson and Lou Diamond Phillips. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed.